culture that is rooted in, grounded in, led by your brand identity. You know, if you think about it, if you want to be known for something out in the world, if you if, if your brand identity is what you want to be known for, your culture needs to be living that out on a regular basis so that you actually are on the inside what you say you are on the outside. So that's what I mean by a brand-led culture, a culture that is is led by the identity that you want to have as a brand. Welcome to the industry's leading business podcast for fitness owners and managers. We'd like to thank this month's premier podcast partner, Jim Sales. Jim Sales gives your sales team the tools they need to capture, nurture, and convert new members. Visit gymsales.net to find out more. Hi, everyone. I'm your host, Chantal Broderick. Thank you for joining me. This week, my special guest is Denise Leon. Denise is the go-to expert on brand leadership for national media outlets. She's an in-demand speaker and consultant and an influential writer. Denise is the author of the best-selling book, What Great Brands Do, The Seven Brand Building Principles That Separate the Best from the Rest, and her new book is titled Fusion, How Integrating Brand and Culture Powers the World's Greatest Companies. Not only is Denise a brand leadership expert and author, she is also a keynote speaker at URSA 2019. During our interview today, Denise shares an overview about her URSA presentation. Then we go on to discuss the definition of brand identity and brand purpose and the benefits for identifying these for your employees and your customers. We chat about the importance of having a brand-led culture and where we can start with creating this within your own business. Denise explains the danger of having a culture and brand that doesn't align, and she shares a great example of this from a brand that I'm sure you're going to recognize. She talks us through how to ensure our employee experiences operate on the same values that we have for our members, and lastly, she shares three actions that you can do immediately to start creating a brand-led culture for your fitness business. We're about to transition into this week's show, but first I want to thank our podcast partner, Jim Sales. Jim Sales allows you to plan, implement, and monitor a proactive sales strategy that is automated and uniform. Give your sales team the tools they need to capture, nurture, and convert new members, making it easier than ever before to grow your member base. Visit gymsales.net to find out more. Enjoy this week's show with special guest, Denise Leon. It is such a pleasure to welcome our special guest for today. Denise, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us on the show today. I'm so excited to be speaking with you. Now, you are going to be presenting a keynote address at URSA Convention 2019. Your session title is The Fusion Formula, Brand Plus Culture Equals Results. And of course, that is based on your new book, Fusion, which I've just read, How Integrating Brand and Culture Powers the World's Greatest Companies. To start off with today, can you share a 60-second overview of your session? Yes, well, I'm really excited to be sharing a message about how and why fitness club owners and managers need to align and integrate their external brand identity and their internal workplace culture. Fusing both your brand and your culture together gives your company so much power, not only within with customers and within the marketplace, but with your employees and with the talent base that you're working with. So it's a it's a timely message, I think, for for your business lead, for business leaders at URSA, and I'm really looking forward to sharing it. Well, we are really looking forward to hearing you. And I just want to shout out a quick reminder for anyone that is attending URSA. Uh, Denise's session, The Fusion Formula, Brand Plus Culture Equals Results, that session will be held on Saturday, March the 16th at 11.30 a.m. So make sure you go ahead and add that to your URSA agenda. Now, Denise, let's drive into our main interview now. Can you start us off with the basics? Can you give us a definition, first of all, of brand identity? 
Yes. So, uh, you know, and I usually just call it your brand, but I'm afraid that sometimes when I use the word brand, people think that I'm meaning your logo or your name or your tagline. And really what I'm talking about when I say brand or brand identity is what you stand for at your core, what you, what you believe in and what you are known for and what distinguishes or differentiates you from other clubs or other businesses like yours. Okay, and let's move on to brand purpose. Help us understand that. Yeah, so it's very related. Your brand purpose is very much related to your brand identity. The one of the things I'll be talking about in my session is how you want to articulate an overarching purpose for your business and your brand. You know, instead of having a mission statement that might describe what your business is all about and then a brand identity or brand essence that talks about what you stand for as a brand, having a brand purpose that explains your why, why you exist, why you do what you do, that's such a critical part of of your brand identity and, and the way that people understand you. And when I say people, again, I mean both your customers or your guests or your members, as well as your employees. They need to know that you create and deliver irreplaceable, invaluable value to their lives in some way. So your brand purpose helps you articulate what that value is. I loved that about the book, how you talk about the importance of it being beneficial for both employees and for customers. And you actually talk about having this brand led culture. So can you help us understand what does it mean for our business and how do we actually go about starting to create a brand-led culture within our own businesses? Yeah, well, let's first start by defining culture, okay? Because I think that you know, it's one of those words that everyone kind of thinks they know. And when I use the word culture, I'm really just kind of talking about the way you do things, you know, the attitudes and behaviors of you and your people. So it's kind of like how you operate and how you how you run your business. And while culture itself is critical, in fact, I would say that there's kind of this culture crisis that we're experiencing around the world, given the lack of employee engagement and the threats to culture from sexual harassment and discrimination and inequality. But the point about having a brand-led culture is that you want a culture that is rooted in, grounded in, led by your brand identity. You know, if you think about it, if you want to be known for something out in the world, if, you, if, if your brand identity is what you want to be known for, your culture needs to be living that out on a regular basis so that you actually are on the inside what you say you are on the outside. So that's what I mean by a brand-led culture, a culture that is is led by the identity that you want to have as a brand. So where would you say we would start when it comes to really creating that foundation? Because I heard you say something in the book, which I love, and I want to share this with everyone, because to me, it was like, it was one of those light bulb moments to understanding culture. You said, culture is not incidental to our business performance. It is instrumental to it. So knowing that it is instrumental, how can we go about really creating that within our business? Well, you know, Chantal, you actually just point, landed on something that's really important, and that is recognizing how instrumental culture is to your business. Um, I, I, I fear, or actually, I, I've, I've actually spoken to a lot of business leaders who think that culture is kind of soft stuff, you know, that they can get around to when they have time, or they can delegate to their HR person or one of their managers, or they think that, you know, culture is something that they really can't manage at all, so you might as well just kind of let it, let your culture grow. And, and evolve naturally. And, and the truth is that your culture needs to be led. It needs to be cultivated um, deliberately and diligently and with discipline. And so that's the responsibility of the leaders, first to just recognize that culture is critical to your business performance. And then from there, we go back to the brand purpose. And I also would say, in addition to having an overarching purpose, you need to have a single set of core values that really describe the the way that you want people to behave and, and the things that are really a priority for the people in your organization. With that as a foundation, with you assuming responsibility for culture and then clearly articulating a brand purpose and core values for your organization, you have 
you have you are well on your way to cultivating a brand led culture. Great foundation. Now, in your experience, what's the danger then? If we look at the flip side, and maybe you've got an example that you can share with us, but what's the danger of having a culture and a brand that don't actually align within our business? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, you know, at best, when you have a brand and culture mismatch, there's confusion, not only for your employees who, who maybe are getting mixed messages about what's really important to the organization or what's the point of, of all their work, as well as, you know, with your customers um, who are saying, who are, who have increased visibility to the inner workings of your company. You know, these days, everyone knows everything about your business, right? Um, I think in the past, you might have been able to kind of hide behind the, the manager's desk or, you know, hide behind the, the, the website and just kind of present an image. But people now know how you run your business. And, and so, you know, if you are saying that your business is about one thing, but then your brand is something else, it causes a lot of confusion. But more uh, importantly, there are dangerous disconnects that can arise when you don't align your brand and your culture. You know, one example is Wells Fargo. You know, last year there was such a, the the company experienced such a setback and a crisis in their performance because they, um, it was revealed thanks to a bunch of whistleblowers that employees were opening up fake bank accounts and fake credit card accounts and customers' names. And they were doing this because there was such a cutthroat, demanding environment that the managers with the organization had created for the employees. And, you know, not only is that kind of just wrong, you know, and, and the, the, you know, the managers shouldn't have been doing that in the first place. But, you know, I think it was such a disconnect to the Wells Fargo that I think we all know and love, you know, this, it's a brand that at least in the U.S. is been associated with kind of this old fashioned wholesomeness. And they've got this you know, stagecoach logo and they run these really heartwarming campaigns. And they were even um, held up as, as kind of an example of, of doing good business during the financial crisis that the U.S. had undergone you know, back in the late 2000s. And yet here we all of a sudden find out, well, you know, they really aren't that wholesome and they don't really have that much as, and as much integrity as we thought we did. And so that's a really dangerous disconnect. And, you know, even if you don't have that degree of, of disconnect or, or the disconnects that you do have don't make the news headlines, you know, I think that you end up suffering from uh, or you open up your organization to a lot of risk as well as waste and poor performance if your brand and your culture aren't aligned. That was a great example, Denise. Thank you for sharing that. It's one that I think we've, we all saw when it happened in the news and that was a really great one for us to understand. Now, I'd love to explore this in the fitness industry because in our industry, we put this huge emphasis on um, making a positive impact in people's lives, on creating memorable experiences for our members. And, you know, so often in our gym environments, we're introducing new equipment, we're introducing new programs and new classes. And you actually say that if you engage your employees differently from how you expect them to engage your customers, then your organization is operating with two sets of values, which we've just touched on. So Mm -hmm. can you help us understand how can we ensure that our employee experiences are also just as positive, just as memorable, and that they're operating on the same values as what we actually have for our members? Yeah. Well, you have to deliberately design your employee experience. Now, you know, um, customer experience has gotten a lot of attention in recent years. And I think that most people have some general understanding of, of, you know, you need to understand what your customers want and need, and that you need to kind of design this, this journey that the customer has with your company, looking at all the different touch points and, and, and interactions. Uh, you have to do the same kind of design work for your employees. Because, you know, as you say, Employees will only can and will only deliver experiences to customers that they have themselves. And so if you want your customers to have a very kind of um, digital, tech-enabled, innovative, kind of, you know, futuristic experience at your club, but everything you do with your employees is manual and paper-based and slow and bureaucratic, you know, your employees are, A, not going to develop the skills and the comfort with technology that they need to engage your customers with it, but B, they're not going to value it. They're, gonna, they're, they're not going to see how transformative digital technologies can really be for 
someone. And so you, you would want, in that case, to be looking at all the different stages of your employee experience from the moment someone becomes aware of you as a potential employer through the recruiting and interviewing process to onboarding to then training, um, development, all the performance planning and comp and benefits and every aspect of the employee experience. You want to design to make sure that you are engaging your employees in the same way that you want them to engage your customers. It's a lot of hard work. You know, this is not kind of one of those things that you can kind of check off the box and say, okay, I'm done. But I think if you, if you want to have extraordinary experiences with your customers or with your guests or members, you need to create extraordinary experiences for your employees. Denise, there was something, one of the chapters that you spoke about in your book, which I wanted to bring up because I feel like this is so relevant for the fitness industry and, and I'll get you to fill in the gaps for, for where, I, where I'm not sure of the story. But um, you spoke about so often in our businesses, we feel like the way to building a culture and the way to connecting with our employees is traditionally might be giving them bonuses or giving them days off or giving them gifts of some sort. But there was one case study in particular that you talked about, which was, I think the company was called Autodesk. And oh, yes. Autodesk. Yeah, Autodesk. And one of the mm-hmm. things that, that was said in that that I thought was so relevant for our industry is when they were hearing feedback from their teams about what impacted them the most, one of the most common things they said is that, they are, that their employees were most excited about having a meaningful impact on the world. And I feel like in the fitness industry, that's a huge driver for us. I mean, so many of us are passionate about having an impact on the world and on the people in our, in our businesses and in our communities. How do you think that we, as let's say, as owners and managers, can best embrace that with our employees? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, I think it always needs to be part of your communication and your engagement with employees. You need to connect the dots for them and, and show them the kind of impact that they as individuals and then they as a team and then you as a company and as a brand really have on customers and, and, and on the world, on your community and then the world. You know, so I think that you can't like assume that your employees get it. I mean, you, you would hope that because they are working for a fitness related company that they there would be some sort of understanding but you can't take that for granted and and sometimes i think in the in a lot of the the hard work and the day-to-day grind that every job and every employee experiences people forget and so you as a leader need to be constantly reminding people about what that purpose is and about your impact and always inspiring them, you know, because you can give people all the perks and parties and, and bennies and, and, and still not fully engage them because you know what, they can probably get those same kinds of perks, parties and bennies from someone else, you know, so you have a ping pong table. Well, the guy down the street has a foosball table, you know, like it, but if you can, if you can help them understand the, the impact that they're having, particularly with the millennial generation and even younger workers who we know from the data that having a meaningful impact on the world is very important to them. By helping them understand that they're doing that, you will engage in them far more successfully than any of those kind of surface level tactics. Yes, I love that point. Well, look, Denise, we've already covered a lot of ground today and I'm just even more excited to see you present at Ursa this year. But we're going to wrap things up today with a bit of a summary. And perhaps you can leave us today with three actions that fitness business owners can do to immediately start creating a brand-led culture within their business. Right. Well, actually, in my talk, I will actually be talking about five actions and helping people develop an action plan based on those five actions. But let me break down the first action, which is all about cultural leadership. And we kind of started talking about this before, but there are three parts to cultural leadership that you can start working on right away. The first is communication. Like I said, you need to be connecting the dots for your employees, helping them understand what your brand stands for, what you want your brand to stand for, and how they contribute, how they can contribute to that. So communication. Secondly, role modeling. You know, people, your people are watching you and they take note of all the little things you do and don't do or say and don't say. And so you want to embody the values that then you expect to, that, that, them to embody to your, your customers. So, so communication, role modeling. And the third action under leadership is 
your people decisions, who you hire, who you fire, who you promote, and you de- who you develop, you need to make sure that you are evaluating people based on their alignment to your culture and to your purpose and the way and whether or not they embrace your, your culture and your values and promote them and encourage and support them. And so right away, you can t- be taking a look at your current staff and asking yourself, Who's really supporting where we're going and and who's not? And even if they're a great performer, but if they're not aligned with your culture, you might need to give some thought to whether you need to let those folks go. So those are the three actions, communication, role modeling, people decisions. And then, like I said, I'm going to be sharing a whole action plan during my session at Versa. Well, I absolutely can't wait. And I know that there's going to be so many people that are really excited to come along. So a quick reminder to everyone that Denise's session is being held on Saturday, March the 16th at 11.30 a.m. at URSA 2019. I'll be putting a direct link to URSA and also to Denise's session in the show notes so you can read all about it. Uh, Now, the other thing is, Denise, of course, your new book, your fantastic new book, Fusion, How Integrating Brand and Culture Powers the World's greatest companies. It is available to purchase right now. Where is the best place for listeners to purchase your book? Chantel, thank you so much for asking that. I really appreciate it. Definitely, you can get it at all retailers, e-tailers, you know, Amazon, and it's available in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook. And if you go to my website, denisleon.com, you'll be able to download the first chapter for free, as well as other sorts of resources, free resources and materials. So that's another way for you to get some exposure to it. That is wonderful. Well, I uh, I read it as I said. I'm saying in a little little quote marks. I read it on Audible, uh, <laughs> and uh, absolutely loved it. So I want to thank you so much. It's a real honor and a privilege to have you join us on the Fitness Business Podcast, and we cannot wait to hear you speak at URSA 2019. Denise, thank you so much. Thank you. Are you interested in increasing your centre's income and your trainer's income from small group training? Tribe Team Training is the new way to get more members engaged in small group training and paying extra. Click the Tribe Team Training link in the show notes or go to tribeteamtraining.com.au forward slash podcast for your free formula to see how much income you can make from small group training. Precore Quick Fire 5. This week's prequel Quick Fire 5 guest is speaker and author Andrea Val. I want to say a very warm welcome to my special guest for today. Andrea, welcome and thank you for joining us on the show today. Yeah, thank you so much. It's great to be here. Now, we kick off each of our shows with our Quick Fire 5 questions. So tell everyone, why do you do what you do? Yeah, I am really just passionate about helping small business owners grow their businesses. I feel like it makes such a huge difference into their families and in their lives. And just, I love the flexibility and freedom that can come with owning your own business. So that's my passion. And are there any rituals that help you become better at what you do? Well, definitely just um, being on Facebook all day. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> very distracting place to be, but it does um, by by helping other people and doing con- consulting with them and also running ad campaigns. It really helps me notice changes that are happening as they you know as they come, and blogging about them really helps me communicate the changes in a very logical way. And I'm very big into step by step instructions. See, unlike the rest of us, Andrea, you actually have a very legitimate excuse to spend the day on Facebook. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And um, when it comes to staying in control of your workload, are there any apps or systems that you use? Any apps? Mm. Yeah. So I I definitely like to use Asana, which is a um, kind of project management tool. There are so many great tools out there that can that can help you organize as well. And you know, I think Asana's a great way for me to just put things into lists and kind of see when things have to happen. And then, yeah, that's that's really about it. There, I just had a recent tool post that I had with lots of tools I use like Dropbox and Google Drive and things like that that can also help me. 
Yeah, Asana is a great one. There's so many fantastic sort of project management tools out there and that's one that we hear of quite a lot. And Andrea, are there any books, you can say your own by the way, (laughs) podcasts or blogs that you would recommend to our listeners and why? Yeah, so Social Media Examiner is one of my favorite blogs out there and and the podcast as well. I worked with Social Media Examiner for a couple of years as their Facebook community manager and I speak at their event and I just, it's a great, great resource for information about social media marketing. Um, and And definitely I'm a big believer in books that help your mindset, things like Seth Godin's The Dip and, you know, just, I'm actually just going back to some of the classics like How to Win Friends and Influence People and The Power of Positive Thinking, because I think as business owners, having a healthy, good mindset is a challenge. Well, I'll let you in on a little secret because Social Media Marketing Podcast is my second favorite podcast after the Fitness Business Podcast. (laughs) And uh, and we've been really lucky because we've actually had Michael Stelzner and we've had Eric Fisher on the show before. So all of us are very familiar with what a fantastic resource that is. And um, just to wrap up our quick fire, I just wanted to let everyone know that the topic that we're going to be focusing on next week, we're really lucky to have Andrea because we're actually going to divide our interview up into two parts. Part one, we're going to talk about Facebook ad changes. And in part two, we're going to talk about top Facebook ad tactics, get this, for gym owners and personal trainers. So Andrea, thank you for joining us for this portion of the show. And we're going to get stuck into your main interview. Awesome. Thank you for joining me for this week's show and a reminder that all the resources and links for today's episode can all be found at fitnessbusinesspodcast.com. I'd like to thank our founding partner, Active Management. As a listener to the show, you have a special opportunity to work with JT from Active Management. In fact, you can get one free session when you buy one coaching session. No matter where in the world you are, technology allows him to work with you. All you need to do is go to activemgmt.com.au forward slash FBP family and work with JT to get more people moving and moving more often. Once again, that is one free session when you buy one coaching session and it is exclusive to you. Go to activemgmt.com.au forward slash FBP family. As we finish off today's show, I always ask you to remember that what you leave behind is not what's engraved in stone monuments, but what is woven into the lives of others.